Welcome. This is the one year Bible reading for July 28th, and we are starting today in 2 Chronicles chapter 21. And it says, When Jehoshaphat died, he was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. Then his son, Jehoram, became the next king. Jehoram's brothers, the other sons of Jehoshaphat, were Azariah, Jael, Zechariah, Azariahu, Michael, and Shephatiah. Their father had given each of them valuable gifts of silver, gold, and costly items, and also the ownership of some of Judah's fortified cities. However, Jehoram became the next king because he was the oldest. But when Jehoram had become solidly established as king, he killed all his brothers and some of the other leaders of Israel. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years. But Jehoram followed the example of the kings of Israel and was as wicked as King Ahab, for he had married one of Ahab's daughters. So Jehoram did what was evil in the Lord's sight, but the Lord was not willing to destroy David's dynasty, for he had made a covenant with David and promised that his descendants would continue to rule forever. During Jehoram's reign, the Edomites revolted against Judah and crowned their own king. So Jehoram went to attack Edom with his full army and all his chariots. The Edomites surrounded him and his charioteers, but he escaped at night under the cover of darkness. Edom has been independent from Judah to this day. The town of Libna revolted about that same time because Jehoram had abandoned the Lord, the God of his ancestors. He had built pagan shrines in the hill country of Judah and had led the people of Jerusalem and Judah to give themselves to pagan gods. Then Elijah the prophet wrote Jehoram this letter. This is what the Lord, the God of your ancestor David, says. You have not followed the good example of your father Jehoshaphat or your grandfather King Asa of Judah. Instead, you have been as evil as the kings of Israel. You have led the people of Jerusalem and Judah to worship idols, just as King Ahab did in Israel. And you have even killed your own brothers, men who were better than you. Now the Lord is about to strike you, your people, your children, your wives, and all that is yours, with a heavy blow. You yourself will be stricken with a severe intestinal disease until it causes your bowels to come out. <clears throat> Then the Lord stirred up the Philistines and the Arabs who lived near the Ethiopians to attack Jehoram. They marched against Judah, broke down its defenses, and carried away everything of value in the royal palace, including his sons and his wives. Only his youngest son, Ahaziah, was spared. It was after this that the Lord struck Jehoram with the severe intestinal disease. In the course of time, at the end of two years, the disease had caused his bowels to come out and he died in agony. His people did not build a great fire to honor him at his funeral as they had done for his ancestors. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years. No one was sorry when he died. He was buried in the city of David, but not in the royal cemetery. Then the people of Jerusalem made Ahaziah, Jehoram's youngest son, their next king. The marauding bands of Arabs had killed all the other sons. So Ahaziah, son of Jehoram, reigned as king of Judah. Ahaziah was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem one year. His mother was Athaliah, a, da a granddaughter of King Omri of Israel. Ahaziah also followed the evil example of King Ahab's family, for his mother encouraged him in doing wrong. You can see the impact of women here, can't we? Both as wives and as mothers. Uh, he did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as Ahab had done. After the death of his father, members of Ahab's family became his advisors, and they led him to ruin. Following their evil advice, Ahaziah made an alliance with King Joram, the son of King Ahab of Israel. They went out to fight King Hazael of Aram at Ramoth Gilead, and the Arameans wounded Joram in the battle. Joram returned to Jezreel to recover from his wounds, and King Ahaziah of Judah went to Jezreel to visit him. But this turned out to be a fatal mistake, for God had decided to punish Ahaziah. It was during this visit that Ahaziah went out with Joram to meet Jehu, son of Nimshai, whom the Lord had appointed at the end of the dynasty of Ahab. 
While Jehu was executing judgment against the family of Ahab, he happened to meet some of Judah's officials and Ahaziah's relatives who were attending Ahaziah. So Jehu killed them all. Then Jehu's men searched for Ahaziah, and they found him hiding in the city of Samaria. They brought him to Jehu, who killed him. Ahaziah was given a decent burial because the people said, He was the grandson of Jehoshaphat, a man who sought the Lord with his, all his heart. None of the surviving members of Ahaziah's family was capable of ru ruling the kingdom. When Athaliah, ah, Athaliah, <laughs> the mother of King Ahaziah of Judah, learned that her son was dead. She set out to destroy the rest of Judah's royal family. But Ahaziah's sister, Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Jehoram, took Ahaziah's infant son, Joash, and stole him away from the rest of the king's children, who were about to be killed. She put Joash and his nurse in a bedroom. In this way, Jehoshaphat, the wife of Jehoiada, the, the priest, hid the child so that Athaliah could not murder him. Joash remained hidden in the temple of God for six years while Athaliah ruled over the land. In the seventh year of Athaliah's reign, Jehoiada the priest decided to act. He got up his courage and made a pact with the five army commanders, Azariah, son of Jehoram, Ishmael, son of Jehonanan, Azariah, son of Obed, Messiah, son of Adiah, and Elishaphat, son of Zikri. These men traveled secretly throughout Judah and summoned the Levites and clan leaders in Judah's town to come to Jerusalem. They all gathered at the temple of God, where they made a covenant with Joash, the young king. Jehoiada said to them, The time has come for the king's son to reign. The Lord has promised that a a descendant of David will be our king. This is what you must do. When the priests and Levites come on duty on the Sabbath, a third of them will serve as gatekeepers. Another third will go over to the royal palace and a final third will be at the foundation gate. Everyone else should stay in the courtyards of the Lord's temple. Remember, only the priests and Levites on duty may enter the temple of the Lord for they are set apart as holy. The rest of the people must obey the Lord's instructions and stay outside. You Lev Levites, form a bodyguard for the king and keep your weapons in hand. Any unauthorized person who enters the temple must be killed. Stay right beside the king at all times. So the Levites and the people did everything just as Jehoiada the priest ordered. The commanders took charge of the men reporting for duty that Sabbath, as well as those who were going off duty. Jehoiada the priest did not let anyone go home after their shift ended. Then Jehoiada supplied the commanders with spears and shields that had once belonged to King David and were stored in the temple of God. He stationed the guards around the king with their weapons ready. They formed a line from the south side of the temple around to the north side and all around the altar. Then Jehoiada and his sons brought out Joash, the king's son, and placed the crown on his head. They presented Joash with a copy of God's laws and proclaimed him king. Then they anointed him, and everyone shouted, Long live the king! When Athaliah, Athaliah heard the noise of the people running and the shouts of praise to the king, she hurried to the Lord's temple to see what was happening. And she saw the newly crowned king standing in his place of authority by the pillar at the temple entrance. The officers and trumpeteers, trumpeters were surrounding him, and people from all over the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets. Singers with musical instruments were leading the people in a great celebration. When Athaliah saw all of this, she tore her clothes in despair and shouted, Treason! Treason! Then Jehoiada the priest ordered the commanders who were in charge of the troops, Take her out of the temple and kill anyone who tries to rescue her. Do not kill her here in the temple of the Lord. So they seized her and led her out to the gate where horses enter the palace grounds, and they killed her there. Then Jehoiada made a covenant between himself and the king and the people that they would be the Lord's people. And all the people went over to the temple of Baal and tore it down. They demolished the altars and smashed the idols, and they killed Matan, the priest of Baal, in front of the altars. Jehoiada now put the Levitical priests in charge of the temple of the Lord, following all the instructions given by David. 
He also commanded them to present burnt offerings to the Lord, as prescribed by the law of Moses, and to sing and rejoice as David had instructed. He stationed gatekeepers at the gates of the Lord's temple to keep those who were ceremonially unclean from entering. Then the commanders, nobles, rulers, and all the people escorted the king from the temple of the Lord. They went through the upper gate and into the palace, and they seated the king on the royal throne. So all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was peaceful because Goliath had been killed. Romans 11, 13 through 36. I, Paul, am saying all of this, especially for you Gentiles. God has appointed me as the apostle to the Gentiles. I lay great stress on this, for I want to find a way to make the Jews want what you Gentiles have, and in that way, I might save some of them. For since the Jews' rejection meant that God offered salvation to the rest of the world, how much more wonderful their acceptance will be. It will be life for those who were dead. And since Abraham and the other patriarchs were holy, their children will also be holy. For if the roots of the tree are holy, the branches will be too. But some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the Jews have been broken off. And you Gentiles who were branches from a wild olive tree were grafted in. So now you also receive blessing, the blessing that God has promised Abraham and his children, sharing in God's rich nourishment of his special olive tree. But you must be careful not to brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. Remember, you are just a branch, not the root. Well, you may say, those branches were broken off to make room for me. Yes, but remember, those branches, the Jews, were broken off because they didn't believe God. And you were there because you do believe. I don't, don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the branches he put there in the first place, he won't spare you either. Notice how God is both kind and severe. He is severe to those who disobeyed but kind to you as you continue to trust in his kindness. But if you stop trusting, you will also be cut off. And if the Jews turn from their unbelief, God will graft them back into the tree again. He has the power to do it. For if God was willing to take you, who were by nature branches from a wild olive tree and graft you into his own good tree, a very unusual thing to do, he will be far more eager to graft the Jews back into the tree where they belong. I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters, so that you will not feel proud and start bragging. Some of the Jews have hard hearts, but this will last only until the complete number of Gentiles comes to Christ. And so all Israel will be saved. Do you remember what the prophet said about this? A deliverer will come from Jerusalem, and he will turn Israel from all ungodliness. And then I will keep my covenant with them and take away their sins. Many of the Jews are now enemies of the good news, but this has been to your benefit, for God has given his gifts to you Gentiles. Yet the Jews are still his chosen people because of his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. Once you Gentiles were rebels against God, but when the Jews refused his mercy, God was merciful to you instead. And now, in the same way, the Jews are the rebels, and God's mercy has come to you. But someday they too will share in God's mercy. For God has imprisoned all people in their own disobedience so he could have mercy on everyone. Oh, what a wonderful God we have! How great are his riches and wisdom and knowledge! How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his methods! For who can know what the Lord is thinking? Who knows enough to be his counselor? And who could ever give him so much that he would have to pay it back? For everything comes from him. Everything exists by his power and is intended for his glory. To him be glory evermore. Amen. Psalm 22. This is a psalm of David, and you'll recognize that the first words were repeated by Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why do you remain so distant? Why do you ignore my cries for help? Every day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night you hear my voice, but I find no relief. 
yet you are holy. The praises of Israel surround your throne. Our ancestors trusted in you and you rescued them. You heard their cries for help and saved them. They put their trust in you and were never disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man. I am scorned and despised by all. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads, saying, Is this the one who relies on the Lord? Then let the Lord save him. If the Lord loves him so much, let the Lord rescue him. Yet you brought me safely from my mother's womb and led me to trust you when I was a nursing infant. I was thrust upon you at my birth. You have been my God from the moment I was born. Do not stay so far from me, for trouble is near, and no one else can help me. My enemies surround me like a herd of bulls. Fierce bulls of Bashan have hemmed me in. Like roaring lions attacking their prey, they come at me with open mouths. My life is poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength has dried up like sun-baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You have laid me in the dust and left me for dead. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count every bone in my body. My enemies stare at me and gloat. They divide my clothes among themselves and throw dice for my garments. This is so reminiscent of the crucifixion that it's hard for us to remember that it was written hundreds of years before it happened. Proverbs 20, verse 7. The godly walk with integrity. Blessed are their children after them. And this morning I have a little break from our The Life You Always Wanted series. The next chapter is about the practice of prayer. Um, but I didn't get a chance to review that before today. Plus, I feel like we could practice being unhurried another day or two longer. So I have a blessing for you to end this morning. And it is taken from John 15, 16 and 17. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. May you begin to see your disappointments as divine appointments. May your spirit eyes open up to God's invitation to something better, something deeper, something profoundly fitted for you. May you lift your eyes and see how your whole story fits into the bigger story God is writing for his namesake. God intends to solve some of the world's problems through you. Trust him and let him use you in ways that are beyond you. Look for those appointments and have a great day. <laughs> Love you all.